My name is David Zweig. I'm a journalist. I've been writing quite a bit about um, the pandemic, but in specific uh, sense about children in schools and looking at the evidence and how that may go along with, with a lot of policies and also how the evidence also seems to diverge from a lot of policies that are in place. But that's pulling the lens back that's brought me to kind of the larger discussion around the pandemic and different approaches. To start off, I want to thank the AIER for inviting me here and for um, organizing this terrific event and Jeffrey for helping to put this together and Martin Kaldorf for putting this together. So we, for those who don't know, we have four world-renowned experts in epidemiology and health policy with us today. Well, one of them is with us virtually, but three in the room. Um, and what's interesting about these experts who are with us is that their views, at least by some of the public, are perceived to be in the minority from about how the U.S. and a number of other countries should be approaching the pandemic, or at least in, in, in the sense of viral mitigation, um, and both the advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches. All four of them have talked critically about lockdowns and also critically about some other mainstream approaches. So I want to speak with the experts today about your views and also talk about in, in sort of a more macro sense, why you think that you are either in the minority or at least the perceived minority, um, whether that's not actually the case. Maybe there is it a sense that the public thinks you're in a minority view, but within the scientific community, it's not, but that sort of viewpoint isn't aired as much as it should be. I'm just gonna give a little introduction for each, for each person who's participating here. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that Oftentimes in the newspaper, we hear about an epidemiologist, but there are actually different types of epidemiologists, um, and each of the experts here with us have their own um, areas that they focus on. So Dr. Martin Kaldorf uh, is a professor at Harvard Medical School. He studies infectious disease outbreaks and disease surveillance. Um, he studies how to detect them quickly and monitor them. He has developed methods that are used by almost every country, um, sort of their version of the CDC, as we have here in the United States, and almost every state health department in the US. He works closely with New York City. Um, he wor works closely with the CDC on vaccine safety. And he will be working with the CDC once vaccines presumably will be approved for the coronavirus. The CDC and the FDA already use um, Dr. Kaldorf's methods for monitoring drug and vaccine safety. Stefan Baral, who is with us virtually, is a physician and an infectious disease epidemiologist at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. He's been involved in HIV epidemiology, prevention, and implementation uh, research focused on epidemiology in, in a human rights context. Uh, Mr. Baral acts as the director of the Key Populations Program for the Center of Public Health and Human Rights at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Sunetra Gupta is a professor of theoretical epidemiology at the University of Oxford. She looks into the evolution of diversity in pathogens with a particular reference to infectious diseases, agents, and mathematical models to generate new hypotheses regarding how these processes determine the population structure of pathogens. Basically, how to understand how disease transmits from one person to another in common language. And finally, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is a physician and a professor of medicine at Stanford University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. He directs Stanford's Center for Demography and Economics of Health and Aging. And Dr. Bhattacharya's research focuses on health and well-being of vulnerable populations with a particular emphasis on the role of government programs, biomedical innovation, and economics. Dr. Bhattacharya has a medical degree and a PhD in economics, both from Stanford. So I'm going to start off with um, Dr. Gupta. You said that there's um, a puritanical criticism of herd immunity. Um, you know, when regular people, I think many regular people hear the term herd immunity, they think it's almost immoral or cruel. It's the idea of letting a virus like, burn through a community or a country even. Um, because what I want to get at is you've been a scholar of infectious disease epidemiology for many years. Your life's work, presumably, is looking toward finding solutions and paths toward protecting and helping society. So in my mind, there seems to be a dis cognitive dissonance that a person whose life work is to protect people in society, why your approach is branded as this sort of immoral or cruel idea. Something there doesn't seem to fit. 
Um, so first, I'm wondering if you could encapsulate your argument about the approach, and then putting whether or not your approach is correct or not, putting that aside, if you could talk about this sort of moral attack, if you will, um, on what you've been proposing. And what, what I think people, myself, and I think what others want to understand is whether or not, is this really a PR problem about, and maybe this type of form is, can help be a solution to that? Um, or is there something else at play? Is this unusual um, to have this type of moral argument um, in your field? Um, or is this something that's been happening for, for years and years? Right, so there's there's a lot packed <laughs> into there. <laughs> there a lot there. Where okay, do you go. start? <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, why has herd immunity become such a um, dirty word, the H word mm -hmm. now? Um, so mostly I say I don't understand. Mostly I say I don't know because obviously one could uh, start to unpick the word herd and say, okay, there are these connotations of, well, some, something to do with natural selection, and people have brought in eugenics, but, but, you know, these are all sort of almost like verbal associations. It's, it's sort of incomprehensible, or maybe it is comprehensible, but only in those very superficial terms. That, okay, heard, I heard someone the other day using the word veterinary herd immunity. So there's a sense of being us being treated like animals in somehow embedded in that. And, and that's unfortunate. And it leaves you, puts you in a quandary as to whether to continue to use the term or just say, well, actually, guys, no, 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 that's not what it's about. This is something that happens at a population level, this is just a natural process by which people become, you know, you become infected and then you become immune, at least for a, a period of time. And that is how epidemics come under control or any infectious disease that we live with. That's, of the many infectious diseases that we live with, that's how uh, we achieve a kind of balance with them in that when they first arrive, if they arrive into what we call a naive population, you will get this massive outbreak because a lot of people are susceptible, which is the opposite of being immune. And then the pathogen will rip through, a word again used in a kind of negative sense, the, the pathogen will spread, and as it spreads within the system, this process, which is essentially an ecological process, um, the pathogen consumes its own resources. And that is how immunity, herd immunity, develops. So herd immunity is a term that is basically used to distinguish from individual immunity. So you, as an individual, become immune. So you will never be infected again, and that's all very well. And at an individual level, that's all you need to know. But at a community level, how well the pathogen does depends on how many people are immune. So then you can think of other terms like collective immunity or population level immunity. Um, so that's one option to get people away from herd immunity. But then there's another part of me anyway which says, no, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that because this is not right. This isn't how... We should all operate, I mean, our relationship with words and concepts needs to be at a more sophisticated level. Otherwise, and otherwise, this will damage not just how we um, address this epidemic, but how we move forward in life, how we live our lives. So, I mean, in some ways, this, what we're facing here is a crisis. This crisis is, I think, arising from a level of, a, a lack of, education or sophistication in thinking, um, by which I don't mean, oh, not everyone knows mathematics, not at all. I think that we need to approach this problem as, from so many different dimensions. We need to do what humans do, which is make very complex decisions on a lands very complicated landscape of risks and costs and benefits. And we've done that all along with all the risks we face, including those that arise from infectious 
other infectious diseases. And somehow, this event has plunged us into a crisis where we can't do it anymore. We can't find that equilibrium anymore. And I think it's, at some level, as much a crisis of language as it is a fundamental understanding of how a pathogen spreads, how we adapt to risk, what the social contract is that mediates, that allows us to arrive at these positions. But, but drilling in beyond just merely, um, you know, the, a language or PR problem, you know, using a word like herd immunity, if that has connotations to it, but, but sort of drilling in, and, and by the way, a, a, anyone who wants to chime in on, on any question, your, your approach seems to diverge from the general uh, approach advocated by Dr. Fauci or you know, the CDC, at least as it's perceived. Can you talk a little bit about, and, and I think all of the experts here share, at least in, a, in broad strokes, similar ideas about what the right approach would be. The main, your main critique of what's happening now, and what is the main critique against what you are proposing? You know, the, the perception is that what you're proposing will entail more people dying, um, to put it you know, in, in blunt terms. Um, is that incorrect? Or what, what, can you break down why, make your case, why, in, in, you know, in succinct yeah. fashion, why does this make more sense for what you're proposing and how will this have less um, health costs? And, right. Or is this yeah. not the right question to even ask? No, absolutely, right. I think it is. But did you want to say something? No, please. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, in very simple terms, you have this process that is unfolding in front of us, which is, whereby a pathogen enters a population and then what happens is if left unchecked, it will grow. And then as it grows, as I said, it consumes its own resources. So there comes a point when it stops to increase in numbers, comes down, and then eventually it ends up at a sort of what we call an endemic equilibrium state, whereby it's kept under control by herd immunity, by people in the population having enough immunity that it doesn't cause a huge rise spark in, in numbers. Um, so that's the, the, the background, that's the skeleton. Now, what do we do? What, what are the points at which we can make things better, intervene, stop things from being, you know, obviously we want our objective, the goal is to stop people from dying, um, at least just on that axis of what happens with respect to that pathogen. And what can we do? We can uh, try and eliminate it. We can try and eradicate it, stop it from getting in at all. And that clearly is not a valid strategy. It's been tried, and hopefully now that's been put to bed. Um, you saying it's been tried during this pandemic, or yeah, there's during evidence pandemic, from past I mean, pandemics where it's just not an effective? No, no, no. Of course, you you can eradicate. I mean, there there are some pathogens that have, we have been able to. SARS one, for example. Okay. Um, outbreaks of Ebola, you know, we can, there are certain pathogens that we can contain by those means, but um, this one is clearly, does, isn't, doesn't fall in that category. Mm -hmm. So then, so we abandon that, so what's the next thing we can do? Next thing we can do is try and keep the numbers down. And that's the strategy that I think um, was never discussed fully or transparently, because that comes at a huge cost. And also, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have an end. So you can keep, keep the numbers down, but you ha the cost of that is, I think, becoming more and more evident. And so it doesn't seem to be a sustainable strategy, and it doesn't seem to be uh, one that recognizes that there are other things to consider in implementing any kind of control strategy, which is what is it going to do to the rest of the population. So then there's this third strategy, which is what we're advocating, which is let herd immunity build up in the population. Now that sounds to some people pretty scary because it sounds like you're saying, well, you know, there, there are going to be some deaths along the way, but what can we do? And actually, the truth is, 
given the nature of this pathogen and who it infects and who it kills, we can do something, which is shield the vulnerable people while allowing those who are not vulnerable to death and disease to build up herd immunity. And then we reach the point which, where everyone wins in that those who are not vulnerable will be immune. Those who are vulnerable still will have a lower risk of contracting the disease. And hopefully it will, and if it's not already at that place, um, be a similar a risk that's commensurate or, or similar in, uh, to other pathogens we live with, mm -hmm. like influenza. So if we can get to that stage and shield people temporarily for a period of time um, to stop deaths as best we can occurring in those groups, it would seem that that is a strategy that any, um, that that is the most, well, I always said that any welfare state would want to adopt. Um, Dr. Koldorf, sort of dovetailing with what Dr. Gupta um, was speaking about, you, you had written, um, these are my words, yeah, I'm paraphrasing, but that instead of people finger wagging, you know, against um, when uh, photographs or videos appear on social media of uh, people in their, young people, teens or in their 20s, gathering together, um, and, you know, there's this immediate, look at these, you know, tsk, tsk, tsk. Um, you said, well, instead, it should be the opposite. We should be thanking them. Um, and it sounds like that's a little bit, um, you know, or a lot um, in, in line with what Dr. Gupta is saying. Um, it, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the presumption by people who have sort of the opposite viewpoint is that, yes, we're trying to tamp down um, spread of the virus, but it's just for a limited amount of time until we have a vaccine. And then th that if you let it run through, there will be more harm. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone can chime in on this. Why, in your view, does that seem like it doesn't make, if, you know, or, or to talk about a vaccine imminently arriving, is that unlikely? Um, can, can you speak to that a little bit? So a key feature of COVID-19 is the enormous difference in risk by age. So the oldest among us have more than a thousandfold risk of uh, death from COVID compared to children. So among the older people, COVID-19 is worse than the annual uh, influenza, but among children, it's much less risky. And the longer it takes until we reach herd immunity, the more difficult it is to protect the high-risk uh, elderly and other high-risk people. Uh, so that's why this age-targeted strategy or risk-targeted strategy in my view, is the one that will minimize the death in the long term. So we can always sort of suppress things in the short term and push things forward, uh, but that's just a temporary solution. Uh, so herd immunity will arrive sooner or later, as with other infectious diseases, and either through a vaccine or natural immunity or a combination of those two. Uh, so yes, uh, if it was only a couple of months to wait for a vaccine back in the spring, that might be have been sense to make sort of very uh, sort of go go into hiding for a little while, but at this time, after more than half a year, the collateral damage is enormous. With children not going to schools, which is not just their education, but their physical and mental health, uh, house evictions, uh, cancer screenings are not being done properly. So, and that's not going to result in mortality this year. Nobody's going to die from cancer this year because they didn't do the cancer screening, but somebody who would have lived for 15, 20 years might now die in three, four years instead. So those numbers we're not going to see until the future. So there is an enormous uh, collateral damage from lockdowns and other aspects of public health. And one key aspect of public health that we have sort of all thrown out the window is that we can never look at a single disease. If you're a physician seeing your patient, who has uh, cancer, then you focus on that cancer and that patient. But in public health, we cannot do that. We have to look at the whole population and we have to uh, look at all diseases. We can't just focus on COVID-19 mortality now. Mm -hmm. is, there, is, is there a way to even model this type of data? And has it, uh, have people been looking at this? And I see Dr. Bhattacharya, you're shaking your head in the sense of, can we in some way 
quantify you know these um, ancillary harms um, you know, from from this program to, to make the correct calculation about well let's this is an emergency now we are um, causing more harm than good in, in the aggregate versus people who you know the, the broader view seems to be that you know this is such a dangerous uh, pathogen that we need to try to tamp it down you know all these other costs uh, be damned, so to speak, you know, and a vaccine will arrive soon and then everything will be better. Please. Yeah. So I, I think uh, it was incumbent on public health to take those costs into account in the discussion about the lockdown. We've seen an enormous amount of effort to quantify the, uh, the, the deaths from COVID and the spread of COVID. You see it in the, in the, in the you know, these, these, these maps with red, red circles on it of the spread of COVID. Uh, under, you know, undergird by mathematical models of the spread. There should have been a parallel effort to also quantify those at the same time to decide, to make an informed decision. Because to, to call those costs ancillary basically <laughs> answers, it like says an answer to the question even before we've asked it. Um, and I think uh, the evidence that's coming in now is, is absolutely dis is, uh, you know, d devastating. You know, so I, think I saw a UN report that 130 million people Additional will starve as a consequence of the lockdown. Uh, one in four uh, uh, Americans between 18 and 24 seriously considered suicide in June. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, Mark's already mentioned some of the, the harm to children, I think. Uh, these are not a simple ancillary costs. 1.4 1, 1. million tuberculosis patients in India alone are not receiving treatment. Gabi, which is a, a massive vaccination program uh, worldwide, has been suspended. Uh, so, to, you know, Things like uh, diphtheria, pertussis, measles, we're going to see an outbreak. We will. Mm -hmm. um, these are not theoretical costs. These are actual costs on actual humans as a consequence of the lockdown and the economic collapse that it, that's, that it has caused. These costs are not ancillary, and they needed to be included in the calculus when we discussed the lockdown alongside with the mathematical models of disease spread. Um, as Martin said, and as, as, as Sinatra said, though, these are... Uh, uh, it's a complicated question of how to manage all of these things at once. Focusing just on COVID, I think, in answer to your earlier question, I think will end up creating more damage, more lives lost than if we had taken a more holistic view to, to public health. Uh, Dr. Baral, do you want to uh, chime in on, on any of the points thus far? I don't want to leave you out just because you're on yeah. the screen. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, a few things. So one, you know, the models themselves, um, I think, you know, working with many modeling colleagues and involved in a number of these modeling projects myself, you know, what they'll often say is it's just, it's really difficult. Like the models themselves are complicated and they find it very difficult to include, you know, the sort of competing health risks that I think many of us have spoken to as being so important. And so that, that's not an answer that only says that like models obviously should only represent like one component of the decision making process. And if anything, I think it's important to note that I can't think of a time in history when models were used in real time to drive health policy anyways. And so I love models. I've been involved in lots of modeling projects. I'm sure most of the folks um, speaking have, have been as well. I just never, I can never imagine time when we've used those in real time to drive decisions. And I think that, you know, kind of speaks to, you know, how science should intersect with sort of policy in, in, in general and, and, and obviously in a more complicated way and a more nuanced way than, than just the production of models. I, I do want to say a few things. One is also, you know, it's interesting this question about like, how many of us actually agree with the sorts of things that are being said today? And I think the answer is probably more than you think. <laughs> and so, for example, you know, in all of the colleagues that I work with, I've never had like an individual where I can't, like we can't talk through these things or we don't at the, at, at the heart agree that like there are a lot of competing health risks. And, and I think it's, it, it's, I wouldn't use the term obvious, but it's, it's, it's clear. And I think the early data, as Martin spoke about, and, and Jay and others, like, it's clear that there's sort of these immediate, medium, and long-term effects that are going to be payments for the decisions being made now. I think there's been a number of letters proposed. I, there was an example of like the balanceresponse.ca 
um, which was a number, including like the first uh, the first two directors of the Public Health Agency of Canada, along with the first director of Public Health Agency of Ontario, multiple leaders in public health, multiple deans of schools of medicine writing this letter on kind of a, an underdeveloped website that was only covered very superficially. And even so, only to note that these people must be out of touch, even though they're the ones that manage like SARS Part 1, H1N1, Ebola, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that I think is sort of fascinating. And then there was a more recent letter, including uh, earlier this week, put out by even more providers saying the same thing, like this is a tragedy unfolding. And again, it just was only covered sort of at the periphery. So I think, you know, the sort of question about like how many people actually agree is, is, is also sort of a function of like what's being covered and the challenges in writing about some of these things that I think many reporters and everybody sort of up and down because the sort of deep intersection of public health and politics has, has made it such. So I, I just would, you know, at the superficial level, I would say it may not seem like it, there's that much disagreement, but I would actually say science is a process. It's not a destination. And there's lots of folks that agree that there are many, many open questions that need to be answered. Uh, I think in terms of herd immunity, the one thing I would add to Dr. Gupta is, is I think the way I often communicate it is maybe like, I, I'm a deep believer. I think you introduced, I work, you know, at the Center of Public Health and Human Rights. Clinically, I work with marginalized communities that provide care in homeless shelters, as like face-to-face -face care. Um, so equity, uh, you know, I, I believe in sort of viewing things through an equity lens. And equity lens, often what we say is it means doing, you know, more for people who need more. But it also then means doing less for people who need less. You know, and it's often the sort of frame, the other side of equity that we don't often talk about, that in a zero-sum game, if you only have so much resources, you have to kind of use those resources in a way that make most sense and, and save the most lives. Uh, and sometimes the math around those things can feel very cold, like qualities, quality adjusted life years, disability adjusted life years, et cetera, but that are intended to take into account, you know, the benefits and harms of any particular intervention. And I think herd immunity, the, the way I often frame it is like, we want to serve those that either have these individual level risks of morbidity and mortality, or have clearly well-defined networks where we worry about direct onward transmission because they live in multi-generational households, et cetera. And I think those things really necessitate like deeper structural fixes that I don't think are cheap by any means. I don't think anybody on, on this panel is talking about cheap interventions, but then again, we closed our societies and we closed our borders. So I, I, you know, cost ideally at this point doesn't feel like it should be like the direct driver of, of decision making. But I would say that, you know, these fixes are deeper and they're more structural and we haven't talked about them. We seem to be, um, you know, more like the idea of like kind of almost the, almost this perversion of herd immunity, this, this concept, which is just a biological reality. Um, is, is sort of like taking away focus from like really addressing people where risk is of morbidity and mortality and also like their sort of immediate networks. And so I often, I think the, the way that I think it's been said on others, like herd immunity is like, like landing a plane and thinking about gravity. Do you know what I mean? Like you just want to plan around it. Like it exists. It's in the ether. It's, it's not something we have control over. Um, but there's a lot of things that we do have control over. And I think kind of, understanding those biological realities and that we should be fortunate for, um, I think can help us drive our programs. But I don't, at least for me, I, it's not to me like the herd immunity is, is, is as Martin was saying, is going to happen one way or the other. It's just, just the way that it's going to play out either because hopefully a vaccine does appear and does get scaled appropriately or because, you know, sufficient sort of spread has, has, has happened and, 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 you know, whether we try and control it or not. But I think it's it's to me it's still like making decisions around you know maximizing like qualities and dollies or like up the, in, in the avoidance of morbidity and mortality. And I think there's plenty of ways of doing that, and then just understanding that that means doing less for some, and understanding as a result that there may be some natural infections, and and that you know that that when we try and you know serve everybody as we've been trying to do throughout this pandemic, we've effectively served nobody. And I think, you know, the data as a result of that, in terms of like what the effects of these things have been, leaving aside New Zealand, which is an island so unaffected by respiratory viruses that they don't even participate in flu net. 
which is the WHO's, you know, kind of global influenza surveillance program. So leaving aside on, you know, a, a nation state that's in just an island in the middle of the Pacific, um, I think, you know, we have to understand that there are these sort of mitigation strategies that need to be put in place to address, again, individual level and then sort of network level uh, determinants of risk. Um, well, one of the arguments that, that is often made, if not by, by health officials, certainly by regular people in conversations every day on, on social media and elsewhere, is this, this phrase that, that I often hear is, but we don't know for sure. This is, the, it's, called, it's not called the novel coronavirus for nothing. It's because it's novel, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's used as a, as a primary argument against this idea of, of not trying to tamp everything down. And we just need to tamp it down until there's a vaccine. Um, the, thus far, I mean, we're now you know many months into this, and I know Dr. Bhattacharya has some of your research on on um, infection rates. Is there enough data at this point, as experts, that you can say with some degree of confidence? Well, we actually do know. Um, you know, there, because there's also the idea of like the long haulers, but there doesn't seem to be, from what I've read, um, definitive, uh, you know, evidence of that necessarily either. Um, but I'm wondering if you could speak to that, Dr. Bhattacharya, and anyone else, this, this notion of, but we don't know, because that is the primary argument um, that I often hear about why you can't send kids to school, for example. Um, could I quickly just respond to uh, some of Dr. Barrell's point? Sure. I mean, first of all, uh, what role mathematical models play here? Because I completely agree with them and have for a very long time that you cannot use mathematical models in the way that he just mentioned. You put everything in there and come up with a solution. I think mathematical models are absolutely essential. They have been, to me, um, to provide the conceptual framework for this. Mm -hmm. So to understand what is herd immunity, I at least, maybe somebody who's better at conceptualizing things without the aid of maths can do it with that maths. But for me, a mathematical model clarifies what herd immunity is, which I think is, I, I disagree with them that you, it's just something that happens. It is like gravity. I think March and you were the first to use that. But we, we can manipulate it. And in fact, what we can do is we can use it to get an outcome that benefits everybody, which is, I think, the attractive aspect of it. So I'm just going to stop there. Uh, thanks for that question. So I, I think uh, there's a couple of things. So one is we have learned a lot about the disease in the, in the past few months. Uh, we, we've learned who's at risk and who's at, much at less risk, as, as Martin has, has said um, about uh, age. We've learned about other comorbidities as well that put you at risk and, uh, and others that, uh, that put you at less risk. Uh, when we can use those facts to, to design strategies more efficiently and effectively than we had, than we could have in March, um, I think, uh, uh, at, at, and we've also developed many uh, therapies for the disease that didn't exist in March. Um, and you can see with President Trump, for instance, uh, he's being treated with uh, a, a, at least two yeah. drugs that didn't exist. We had no, you know, no idea would be effective in March. So we, I think we learned a, a lot about the disease in, in these few months. Uh, so I think that, that is absolutely true. That premise is right. We've learned, learned right. I wanted, I wanted to get that aside. But the deeper question about risk is really important. We can't know in one, in one in another sense. And that's not just true for this disease. It's true for every disease. There's always risk. And the, the only adult thing to do is to manage those risks appropriately. Think through all of, the, all of the ramifications of what we do. And there's going to be uncertainty no matter what we do. There is no option that is safe. Where So if we lock ourselves in our house, or we lock down our economy, that we've, we've created a safe spot for us, that's, that's an illusion. Um, that action itself creates enormous risks with uncertainties involved, uh, as we talked about earlier. The only choice is to manage those risks on both sides. Uh, you can't cheat and say, look, there's a way to get rid of all the risks on one side, and we'll, and we'll just you know, focus on this one thing. That itself creates uncertainties and risks in and of itself. The, the right thing in, in health policy and public health is to think through those risks, the cost and benefits of, a, of, of any action carefully, balance them, and then make decisions on the basis of them. Right? I, I think there's no, there's no other choice. 
Uh, there's no there's no safe choice. There's no safe. It's an illusion to think that there could be some safe choice here. There just isn't. Well, if somebody is paranoid and and they go around being worried about uh, dying from cancer, or dying from cardiovascular disease, or dying from diabetes, or having a car accident, or dying from the annual flu, then yeah, maybe they want to add COVID nineteen to this long list of things to be afraid of. Um, and maybe they should also have some, uh, uh, do some counseling. But uh, uh, for, for the most of us, uh, this is one more thing uh, in the things that could happen to us, but it doesn't make sense to go around and be uh, terrified about it. Uh, instead, when we drive a car, we put on the seatbelts because that lowers the risks. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but it lowers the risk. So. With COVID, we should wash our hands more carefully, and that lowers the risk, uh, but it doesn't eliminate it. So we have to view COVID-19 as one of many things that can happen in life, but uh, we shouldn't let it interrupt uh, life because that actually has much worse consequences, uh, both in current time, but also long term. And those are equally important. So just like Jay says, we can't sort of be single focused on one particular disease. Um, uh, it seems to me that the argument made in the U.S. in March was, well, you know, this, this spreads very quickly, so lockdown. And everything. Maybe I'm wrong, but the first known diagnosed case of it was in sometime in November in Wuhan, which tells me that wasn't the virus spreading rampantly for quite some time without any reaction. I go to China usually twice a year. The flights in and out of China around the world are just rampant because it's a growing economy. Is it unreasonable for a non-expert like me to speculate that herd immunity was achieved long ago? Yeah, well, I mean, in March we did um, produce a paper saying that that idea was entirely compatible with what we were seeing. Um, but uh, that was very roundly criticized and branded as being a dangerous concept at the time. I mean, we didn't even say that's what happened. We just said, look, there are a variety of scenarios that are compatible with what we're seeing in terms of rises and deaths. And we focused on the UK because we were specifically trying to address what was going on. The lockdown had just come in. And we said there are two extremes that would match this rise in deaths in the UK. One, that the virus has only just taken off and is killing a lot of people that it infects. Or that it has been around for a long time. Um, not years, but months. And that is compatible with, as you say, what we know about travel and movement and the rate at which it spreads. So, and that it's asymptomatic in a lot of people. So there is this other extreme scenario where it came in, you know, started to take off around January, February, um, affected a lot of the population. And now, because there's a lag in deaths, what we're seeing are the people who got it two, three weeks ago and are dying now. And everything in between also fits what we're observing, on which the model that was used to lock down was predicated. So, I mean, our intention at the time was just to say, look, we need to consider the range of possibilities carefully and not just focus on the worst case scenario. And what we need to do is go out there and try and validate to, to measure, to, to measure exposure in society, in the community, to see which of these is more likely to be correct. Can I amplify on that? So what, what you're saying, and this is incredibly important, is that even in March and even now, the, the benefits of a lockdown, which are premised on where we are relative to you know, population immunity, uh, are uncertain, are deeply uncertain. That there's uh, uh, disagreement within the scientific community itself about where we are. Now, if you ask me where, where we are, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can give you my best guess as to how widespread the disease is, how close we are to the population immunity we've been talking about, I don't know. Um, at, you know, I can give you a guess. And it's widely heterogeneous. It is. Yeah. And, and, and it's dependent on how, how people interact with each other, mm -hmm. how much they fear the disease itself creates changes in that threshold. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a lot of uncertainty around that within the scientific community. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of uncertainty around the benefits of the lockdown. Uh, so I think I think that that's really important point, like an incredibly important point. Does this relate to um, you know, which it seems there is some dispute uh, within the scientific community about how to ascertain whether using antibodies, um, you know, sero uh, prevalence studies, um, whether that's the one correct tool to be using. I think that's the only one that the CDC has been reporting. The last I checked, the New York metro area, for example, was around 20%. Um, but there also appears to be some controversy, and whether it's warranted or not, maybe it's just a perception of controversy, regarding other types of immunity. As you said, one is the change in people's behavior, which would affect her immunity, but also T cells and other types of things that aren't gonna show up um, on, you know, on an antibodies test. Um, so at, it seems to be at minimum, if they were showing antibodies at 20%, that, that's the floor. There are likely is some other factors involved as well. But in the absence of knowing for sure, as you're saying, I don't, you're an expert, you're saying, I don't know, you know, it's hard. To, so in the absence of knowing that, then how do we evaluate um, what is a correct path since we don't know um, how much immunity there actually is in, in the society? So it's correct that, so no respectable epidemiologist will claim that a certain percent is needed for herd immunity. Mm -hmm because we don't know, and as uh, Sinatra says, it varies by location. It also varies by what strategy we use, because uh, if those people who have a lot of contacts are immune, that helps a lot with herd immunity, while somebody who is in a, a, in, uh, spends most time at home, if that person is immune, that doesn't really help with herd immunity. Uh, so we don't know that. Uh, neither do we know how many people are currently immune, because as you said, uh, antibodies is sort of just the lower floor of how many people are immune. So it gives us a lower, a lower bound on what it is, but it could be, uh, it's, it's higher than that, and we don't know how much higher. So those are things we don't know, but what we do know is this difference in risk by age and some other risk factors. So that is known and that's been known ever since the first data came out of Wuhan, that there is this enormous difference. So. In determining what strategy to use, we can control the infection fatality rates and those things. They are what they are, and the fact that we don't know exactly what it is or what the herd immunity threshold is, uh, that's something we cannot do anything about the infection fatality rate. Uh, but we know the difference in risk, so that's what we can utilize as a strategy to minimize the mortality by protecting, by doing a much better protection of those that are elderly and other high-risk groups, which we have to do whether we eventually end up with herd immunity through natural infection or vaccine. We have to do a much, much better job protecting those vulnerable groups at the same time as we let your children and younger people live close to normal lives uh, and to minimize the collateral damage that the lockdown is generating. One of the critiques of that, or one of the arguments, you know, in America at least, you know, teachers unions um, have been incredibly vocal about the risk to teachers. And they, so one argument is we don't know for sure about kids. And then even if we resolve that argument, well, you know, let's put that aside. Actually, the data shows that, uh, seem to show that kids are not at risk, you know, by and large, with, with, with rare exception. But then you, that argument's put aside and it's a, yes, but they can still transmit the virus to adults, to teachers, and they are at, at in tremendous harm's way, and we need X amount of money to do X amount of things in the schools. Um, how, how do you um, address that argument so, that so, teachers are at risk, and that's why we need to keep children home? So when we talk about risk, there's two types of risk. One is risk for infection, and children are certainly in risk for infection as uh, young adults and everybody. So anybody can be infected and uh, have the disease and have symptoms. Um, so, but that's different from severe risk or mortality, which is really what is the most concerning. And there, the risk for children is much lower than the annual influenza. Sweden never closed its uh, schools for ages 1 to 15 years. And they came out a report in June or July saying that not a single child in this age group had died from uh, COVID. 
So the risk for children is very low. For teachers, most teachers are at low risk if they are in the 20s, 30s, or 40s. Teachers in the 60s, they are at high risk. So it's important to protect those uh, teachers. They're not so much at risk from the children because children transmit less, but they are at risk from other teachers and so on. So the key thing is to protect them, but instead of closing the whole schools, we can uh, have them uh, teach at home, or maybe they will help other teachers with grading exams or uh, homeworks. So you, we have to sort of focus the prevention on those who really need it, and then uh, uh, let children live normal lives and not hurting them. Because right now, children are carrying a huge burden of this pandemic and how we are approaching this pandemic. Is there, so is, is it really a, a misperception then um, by society or by the teachers unions that, you know, I, I live in New York City, um, which there's an enormous amount of press and coverage regarding the lack of safety in, in schools in general, but in particular big cities where they can't mitigate risk properly. There's um, not appropriate ventilation in the classrooms. They would be too crowded. Um, the teachers don't have appropriate PPE. Um, so how does that play into this? And anyone can, can jump in and answer. Um, because we're trying to drill down here in this conversation, I think, and, and ascertain, is this a reasonable um, argument that they're making, or are they mistaken about what the risk is? And if so, if they are mistaken, why? So it, sorry, can I jump in? So it's, it's in part reasonable and part mistaken. So the, the reasonable <laughs> part is that uh, we should be using resources to protect vulnerable, including vulnerable teachers, everybody vulnerable. We should use that fact, what we've learned about the virus, and we are evidently as a society willing to expend enormous resources to address this virus. But let's let's use those resources intelligently, right? So why not? If that's if that's if that's a concern, and it is that uh, you have sixty oil teachers that are that are at high risk if they get infected. Uh, restructure environments, restructure work 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 plans, whatnot. Do it creatively, given the re lo local resources you have, along with national resources applied to this, uh, to to make those people safe because they actually face a risk. So that, that part is reasonable. What's unreasonable is to, is to entirely shut down in-person education for children, who we know pay, pay an enormous cost from that. Um, so I think it's, it's the, 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 uh, the, the principle is, let's use what we've learned about the virus, and let's use what we know to, uh, the enormous resources we are willing to spend to address the virus intelligently. That's what the SAGE target plan is. It's not do nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a plan to use the resources so that we can do the things we value while still, as best we can, protecting the vulnerable from the virus. But their argument is mm -hmm. the resources haven't been allocated for our schools. There's the windows won't open in a big city school. The teacher, you know, who even in her 20s, 30s, or him, 20s, 30s, 40s, they don't have appropriate masks. The classroom is too crowded. They do. How do you how do you address that? Well, they don't really need ventilation. I mean, it doesn't matter if they're infected. I mean, this is so. I was going to say there's a couple of issues. One is proportion. You know, okay, if I mean I'm 55 years old, and I, I obviously there's a slight risk, I guess, but. You know, why wouldn't we accept that risk okay. to teach students? That's what that's our job. We take on certain risks to perform our duties and our responsibilities. So there's that issue, I think, um, to uh, understand. So there's proportion of risk, and I, and I completely agree that those who are vulnerable, young people can be vulnerable, young teachers and older teachers obviously are, that they resources should be poured in to try and protect them or um, you know, make, allow them to teach virtually or whatever it is. But the other, so, so that there's that, but one thing I wanted to stress was that, which keeps missing from the conversation, is that it is temporary. It's not a permanent state of being. We're not saying this is gonna have to be the case forever. And the sooner the, stu the students become immune, the sooner these people can return to teach in the classroom. So. There is this double benefit, and it is temporary. And these things maybe need to be stressed or enter people's heads when they think, oh, you can't seal off 60-year-olds. 
Well, of course not, not forever. That would be a very drastic thing to do. But but for three months, rather than you know, seeing stopping children going to school for a very long period of time, how is that? You know, that's the trade-off to consider. And the other thing in terms of risk is also to place it in the perspective, in perspective of risks from other infections like flu. And so if, if there is a 40-year-old teacher who's in reasonable good health, who's you know, um, watching or listening or reading about our interview right now, um, who says, well, I teach in a school that doesn't have appropriate ventilation, the classroom is too crowded, I'm frightened. Um, how, how dare you tell me to risk my life or I could die going to a classroom? Do we have, and I think Dr. Bhattacharya, maybe you, although maybe I'm incorrectly uh, focusing on you here, but is there data that says, you know what, that's actually an unfounded worry um, for you, for someone who's, what is the, because I know you've done, uh, I think a number of you have done this age-targeted sort of research. How, because what we really are talking about here is risk. A regular, average person, everyone here, is afraid. Not, not of the coronavirus, but in life. We want to avoid danger. So how do you speak to someone, a 40-year-old, reasonably healthy teacher, who's very frightened? What does the data tell us? Be very careful when driving to work. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I, so let me, Mark Martin's so there, I mean, put that, let me, um, uh, can, so let me, let me say, uh, I think this points to a deep problem in our public health messaging, and I think this has created enormous problems, right? Uh, we know that that 40-year-old teacher from the zero problem studies and from the other, other work, that they face a very moderate risk should they become infected or dying somewhere on the order of uh, two in a thousand. Mm -hmm. you know, 998 of those 40-year-olds will survive mm -hmm. should they become infected out of a thousand. And without serious long-term health with, effects. With, with, I mean, the, the, you know, every, every virus, every record of the flu has, can have some long-term effects, but the, the, the fraction of the population to get those is small. Mm -hmm. right? I, I, I mean, we, we take those seriously and we should account for that, but it's not a hundred out of the, the thousand will have those long-term effects. It's, it's likely to be much smaller from the evidence that I've seen. Um, so, so that needs to be in the public health messaging because the fear is, has arisen because of a mistake in the public health messaging. I've seen it, data that suggests that, 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 uh, that's, that's pretty much established, the people that are vulnerable underestimate the risk they face. And the people that are not vulnerable vastly overestimate the risk they face. It's this misperception of risk that is causing harm. And it's the fault of the public health messaging to not convey what the scientific evidence is saying that's causing this harm. I, don't, I have a lot of sympathy for that 40-year-old teacher that's panicked. It's not his or her fault that they're panicked. The, 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 the messaging that should be coming forward should accurately reflect the data, and it's not. What a come back to the um, topic of risk. Um, and you had a, a clip about driving to school. Um, but before we come back to that, I, I want to pull the lens back a little bit and, and, and talk about what, when, when I began, when I introduced um, the four of you, or, uh, Dr. Morale, who's not with us right now, um, that there, of course, within epidemiology and then more broadly within medicine and healthcare policy, there are different specialties and subspecialties. And one of the things that's perhaps a misperception among the public, when we think of um, Dr. Fauci, he's certainly a well you know, respected and regarded uh, member of your uh, epidemiological community, but he has his own expertise and biases like anyone else does. And I'm wondering for your thoughts on, um, is there a different way that, that public health policy, the messaging, and the approach perhaps should be structured? Where is there always, you know, I guess there's, it's essential to have a figurehead in a government, you know, there's the person, but, but what are the sort of pitfalls of that? And this is not a mark against Dr. Fauci. He's one person, just like you are all individuals, but what I worry about is that there has become, perhaps, a sort of undue reverence for one person's uh, approach when, when he is one among many experts um, within the field. And this touches on, I think, what you, each of you have spoken about before, which is the perception of scientific 
um, uh, consensus that you know, and that you're in a minority versus perhaps the reality within the community um, does not reflect the public perception about your viewpoints. So uh, infectious diseases are complex. So there's no scientist who is who are experts on every aspect of infectious diseases. So uh, uh, Dr. Fauci is a very eminent immunologist. So if you have questions about, yes, you should go ask him, but don't ask me, because that's not my area of expertise. Uh, so usually, uh, unless it's something very simple, I will usually just deflect such questions, because I should focus on my own area of expertise, which is the public health aspects of infectious diseases, how it spreads uh, in the community, how it spreads in the country, how it spreads internationally, how we quickly can detect outbreaks, how we monitor them, uh, what are the processes from spreading from one person to the next, concepts like a herd immunity. So, uh, and that's the sort of expertise of the four of us in terms of infectious disease epidemiology and infectious disease outbreaks. If you wanted to have a discussion about how do we treat uh, COVID patients the best. Well, Stefan Baral, he sees, he's a practicing physician seeing patients uh, with COVID, so he has knowledge in that, but I don't. So you should get a different panel for that thing. If you want to talk about immunology or virology uh, or uh, uh, developing vaccines, uh, Sunatra knows about that, but I don't, so she would be in that panel, but I wouldn't be that. So there's different people among us who have different expertise. And I think journalists uh, maybe should uh, take an approach where they are more broad in who they talk to uh, in, when they want expertise. Now, of course, somebody at Redfield, he's the head of the CDC, and he has a lot of expertise uh, in that agency. So he's the person that have to uh, sort of encompass everything because that's the role of the CDC. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different from the rest of us who are sort of have our areas of expertise. Dr. Bhattacharya in particular, but also I know you've been referenced as well, Dr. Colbert, and of course, um, Dr. Gupta, feel free to chime in. Um, the sort of broader idea that I'm, that I'm sort of pointing at here with asking questions about Dr. Fauci and, uh, and questions about perception of scientific consensus um, around different ideas or approaches and who is sort of like, you know, heretical uh, type of ideas, that there there's a, seems to be a politicization of, around um, a lot of the approach to, to the pandemic. And when you have people in the um, White House or the, the administration citing your work, Dr. Bhattacharya, as well as yours, Dr. Cole, if you're, you're name checked by um, Dr. Atlas and others, there is an immediate, you know, and I can see it on Twitter, other places. So someone's never heard of you, and that's their first time they hear of you is when your name comes out of the mouth of someone with, you know, the Trump from the Trump administration. That's it. You are immediately in that camp, and there's a sort of, um, and I don't, you know, and this might be outside your purview as scientists, but what I'm interested in as a journalist, because this is something that I've been driving at from day one during the pandemic, is how do we. Um, not, you know, it, it seems incredibly disrespectful to view you merely as, to paint you as a political actor. As someone who's, you know, you all spend your lives working on public health issues. So how do we circumvent th this problem where you're not immediately discredited by, and by, by the way, by people who are, you know, in the literati, in the smart set, you are immediately ignored because of a particular idea. How do we get around this problem? Uh, there's several aspects to this. Let me, let me try to uh, let me, let me take a step. So, uh, I, I, I think as scientists, we, we or as, I mean, I'm a healthy economist primarily. I, I, I do work that's aimed at informing public policy. And so it's inevitable that my work will be used by, by people that I may not agree with about 99% of the things. I, I, I had my work not pre COVID used by, uh, and that's actually been the case. Um, and and uh, the issue is like for me, I have to tell the truth from the data that I've seen. My my own analysis. I might I may be right, I may be wrong. It's, it's going to be, in some sense, I I, I have to. The, the, the only thing that, that can guide me is the profession, the, the norms of my profession, 
Uh, and, and then I have to say what I believe, or else why am I in this position at all? I don't have a lot of control over what happens after that. Um, and so I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't sit there regretting it. I just have to keep saying what I believe, what I see. Right? Uh, and if, I, if I'm wrong, people talk, correct me. That's actually, I thank them, because that, that helps me be able to say what, what, what I should be seeing more, more accurately. Right? I think that conversation has to happen. So it, it really is unfortunate if we stop that conversation from happening from political, so like this, this, this political lens coming in. Right? We, we, we have to learn from one another, even if we disagree with each other politically. Even if, I, I don't, I mean, like, even if politics really is in the center of it, if, 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 that, if that stops that conversation, it's a very unfortunate thing. That's one side. That's personal, right? Uh, on, on the other side, and it's also professional, like what my professional responsibilities are. On the other side, uh, and this relates to your question about Dr. Fauci. This is a political question, right? Not not one, uh, not, not a single scientist. So and Martin did a good job explaining the differences among scientists' expertise. Um, but even if you took all the scientists together, to talking about their particular expertise and giving their best best knowledge, that still would not provide the answer of what we as a society should do. That is a fundamentally political question. And people who make those decisions that have uh, their own norms, uh, they, they, they face feedback themselves in the form of electoral politics or, or whatnot. Um, I think that political, the, 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 this idea that scientists should tell us politically what to do is mistaken. Scientists can inform the debate about what should happen, but fundamentally, the trade offs that are involved are political trade offs. And uh, so I think it's, it's kind of inevitable that those political trade-offs would end up bleeding into the, the scientific debate. Uh, as I said, I think that's unfortunate, but it's kind of, I can see why it happens. Um, so I, I, I don't know an answer. I don't know a solution to that. Uh, I, what I can say is, like, let's, let's try to keep listening to each other. There's really no other choice. And let the, the politicians do the work that they're supposed to do and hold them responsible for any mistakes. Let us scientists... Uh, what you know, let us do our work and hold us responsible when we make mistakes. I mean, there's really no, there's no other alternative in a, in a world where we don't know all the answers. So, yes, I mean, what we've been pushing for, mainly myself and Carl Hennigan and Dr. Sakura and others in, in the UK, is to have a debate. And we, there have been calls in the last couple of weeks to unplatform, I think, or deplatform, I think. Whichever um, term they use to to say that we are a, f a fringe, we hold a fringe opinion, and therefore should be the platformed unplatformed, which is really quite worrying to me. And and this sort of trying to align our views with uh, a particular political stance, which in this case happens to be libertarian is, I think, a really cheap political trick to try and just dismiss what we're saying. So I find it really problematic that that's what's occurring um, in the UK. And it is not helped by figures who are associated, you know, seen as figures of authority, making statements to that effect that, that our opinions are dangerous. So I think there is a real problem there, um, and I think we, what, all we, what we can do is encourage that debate. And that's what we're trying to push. And this, is, this ties into your question that I keep asking about, and, and, and perhaps it's not the right question now that I'm thinking out loud about the idea of how in the minority you may or may not be. Um, in one sense, if you actually are in an extreme minority, which I'm not saying you are, but let's say hypothetically your viewpoint is, then the, then the um, perception is, and, and certainly the, the, the optics of it for people is, oh, well, Trump or DeSantis are cherry picking these couple experts who they found, these obscure you know, people who support their view and they're you know, essentially using you as, as a political tool. Um, so in one regard, if, if your view is in a minority, you can see how the, the optics of that, right or wrong, um, present that way. But, that, but you, Dr. Gruber, touched on something really important, which is even if you are in minority, that doesn't mean you're wrong. 
And presumably within science, when it's not as much in the political arena, that, that is still, it, it's still not something to immediately disregard. Um, that, that numbers don't automatically validate a particular position, especially when you know, it's something like this, where there appears to be a certain degree of groupthink around certain ideas. Um, so, I mean, in the entire history of science, when has not being part of the consensus been seen as right. so problematic? In Korea, I've been part of the, the, the <laughs> consensus on some issues and part of and uh, on, the, on the fringe, if you will, on other issues. So, it, on my, it's, you have to say what you see. And you just, there's no other way around it, I think. Um, and and uh, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Uh, in the long run, time will tell. Um, you know, because as we've been talking about, there's a lot of uncertainty. But shutting the debate down by saying that what you're saying is dangerous, just because the public will see that there's disagreement, I think that's really irresponsible. There's another so, option, just quickly, but there is another option, which is to say nothing, and that is, I think, what many of my colleagues expect me to do. And on many an occasion, of course, when I felt methodologically that I disagree with something. I have stayed silent, silent because saying something would not, have, you know, it was not something I felt would necessarily change the course of action. Not that I think that my saying this is going to change or has changed, had any impact on policy, but this time it was a personal responsibility on my part because the effects were really so profound for the decisions to speak out. Uh, I agree with that. and. Among the infectious disease ethnologists that I talk to personally, uh, the majority agrees that the age-targeted approach is, is the appropriate strategy. Uh, some are willing to speak out, others are keeping silence. And, uh, but among the scientific community at large, at large, outside of the infectious disease ethnologists, and of course, I haven't done a random survey of them, so I don't know what the, the actual balance is. It's just my personal uh, connections. But among uh, scientists that are outside of the field, I think there's, a, at least among those who are vocal in the media, there's obviously a strong uh, majority for a, a lockdown contact tracing type of, of strategy. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think that is? Do you have any idea about why is it that there's become this sort of like a group think yeah, uh, consensus outside of the infectious diseases and expert community. Yet within it, you're saying, at least from your perception, that you're you're in a, a very strong majority viewpoint. Um, this is a complete distortion from the, I think the public perception about what's happening, and I think that's potentially very problematic. Um, um, I don't know the answer to that. Important. So maybe instead of you asking me that question, maybe I as a scientist would ask you as a journalist that question. Right. You yeah. might have better insights than I do on that. Yeah, it's. Um, can, I, can I take this out of the most? I mean, and this is, this is speculation on my part, so let me just label it as such. I, I think it's very hard once you've formed uh, an impression about a complicated topic um, to, to, to sort of shift around from that. And we formed an impression that in. February, March, that, that's been very difficult for new evidence to change. I think that's partly human nature. Um, so I think, I, think that, uh, what I, I think that in itself explains a lot of the, like in March, February, March, the idea that contact tracing is not that widespread of disease, look it worked in, in South Korea, look it worked in, in, uh, in, in uh, you know, New Zealand, uh, you say, okay, maybe that will continue to work. As we've learned that it's much more widespread, I, I changed my opinion about that. And, but I think it's hard to change your opinion based on new data in any circumstance. I think that's, I think, explains a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't blame journalists. I don't, I don't blame the public. I think it's just we need to, we need to keep our minds open to the data and what, they're actually, what it's actually telling us. And to some extent, let our priors go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just hard. I have one sort of final broad question that dovetails with this um, because it it's sort of marries the idea of the political but also with the, the sort of concrete um, evidence-based uh, work that we're talking about. So last week, um, 
my throat started feeling strange um, one night, and because I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, I just immediately, you know, said, that's it, this is it, I, I have it, I think I might have COVID, okay, you know, and I start running through all the things, listen, I'm, you know, I'm not in my 40s, I'm pretty healthy, I think I'll be okay, but maybe I'll be unlucky, and then I start running through everything in my mind, I'm like, maybe I've been too cavalier about this all along, you know, who am I, you know, what if, you know, or do the statistics show that I'm not at greater risk of this than I am from the flu or, or getting you know hit by a car or any number of other things. And I start running through this um, in my mind. And um, because what we're talking about here is trying to ascertain not just how to mitigate the spread of the virus, but how much to value um, viral spread, um, mitigation of viral spread versus the harms incurred by that mitigation strategy, right? And those are the things that we're balancing. And, and so one of the things that, that I think is important to mention is that none of the three of you are not wearing masks right now. And this has become in and of itself a political statement, but it's also a scientific uh, uh, assessment that each expert would make and a regular person would make. So um, what I'm curious about is, you know, it, this seems to be outside of the norm um, of what's considered appropriate and safe to not wear a mask in, in this type of context. So I'm curious your thoughts on, um, you know, why you feel comfortable doing so, because again, this is an assumption, which may be incorrect, that that's outside of the, certainly outside of the public perception within, um, the, you know, what's appropriate, but is that outside of the scientific perception and, and is there maybe, a, Dr. Bhattacharya and I spoke about this briefly before, is there not really one correct or incorrect answer on that? Sorry, this is like a whopper of a question. And, but tied into the political also is a moral component. And um, Governor Cuomo has talked about um, when you wear a mask, you're not just protecting yourself, but you're protecting other people. And so you then are combining, you're marrying science with politics with morality that there's actually, you're making a statement about yourself as a person and that you're willing to harm others and disregard your own health. Um, so there's a lot wrapped up in whether or not someone is wearing a mask. So I, and, and that I think in some ways encapsulates a lot of the things we've been talking about. So I'd love to hear each of your thoughts on this. And then after that, then we'll open this up to anyone else who, who um, has questions. So let me let me take a stab at uh, the, the, the kind of now I'll put my mask yeah, please. Mask on. <laughs> <laughs> I have read the, the, the literature, or much, some of the literature on the mask. That, that, that it, there's, it's voluminous and it's hard to. It, I, I can't I confess I've not read all of it. I don't think anyone has read all of it. Um, I'm not overwhelmed by the evidence about the about mask use outside of outside of trained personnel using it. Uh, there's some evidence that it reduces if you're actively, you know. Coughing or, or whatnot, it reduces the the, 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 the how far your your the, the virus might go. That so and, and I, so I think there's some wisdom in the the the, the public health uh, uh, directive to say if you if you can't socially distance, you're indoors, wear a mask. I think that's that's reasonable. Why am I not wearing a mask now? Because I'm trying to communicate to the public and to you. I think it makes it more difficult. So I balance this my opinion about the literature with my risk. Uh, with my, so the, 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 the context of that risk is with what I'm trying to accomplish right now. I think that's we have to always do that. Um, so I, 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 and I, frankly, I'm a little uncomfortable to like address the science of the mask, probably because I, I don't think the science has reached a conclusion yet. Um, now, public health officials have to make some decision about that in the con in the given that there's this uncertain evidence. So I, I'm sympathetic to that as well. I mean, you have to make some some decision. Uh, now let me turn from that to the, the, the second part of your question, I think is really, really important. I, I think um, public health shouldn't divide people from one another. Right? It should seek to, to unify people together. I, so I like one of the big mistakes I think was made during the HIV epidemic is that public health did not do enough to destigmatize people uh, getting HIV. We basically uh, did not do it. it, it uh, we, we, we came to this idea, a very unfortunate idea, that the people that got HIV it was only their fault and nothing else, and we stigmatized them as a result. I, I'm afraid that the, the, the mask issue and COVID itself is, is headed in that direction. 
someone gets COVID, it's their fault. They weren't wearing a mask, right? I, I think we, we can't, as public health, uh, uh, the people in public health work to uh, put out a message that leads to the stigmatization of the people that get the disease. I think that's a big public health mistake. So I think we have to figure out some way to convey the message about what the, where the science is, where, as I said, I think I'm, I'm, it's, it's uncertain at this point, but like you know, other people may disagree, um, the, the, uh, in a way that doesn't lead to the stigmatization. I think, I think, we've, made, I think we've made that mistake with, a, with masks and COVID. We've created this talisman that, that distinguishes between a good person and a bad person and created this social strife. And, and, it, and it's even more poisonous because it's linked to politics. If I'm a Republican, I don't wear a mask. If I'm a Democrat, I wear a mask. It's, in, it's insane, right? I think that, that, that's a big, big mistake uh, that, that public health messaging has created. Um, I think we have to work very hard to, uh, against that. I, mean, I, 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 I want to work against that. I don't want to say, I don't, I, I don't, I, and I, I'm not sure how to do it given this environment, but I think that is, um, that's I think where we are. I, I, is it possible that even people who, uh, public health proponents, may agree and say the evidence is inconclusive, but there's such minimal um, harm done by wearing a mask that it's irresponsible not to do so. Hey, so the, uh, what, what would you, what would you, I, mean, I, I, I don't, <laughs> there's a school of thought that wearing, like a, a, a wearing a mask for an extended period of time where you're touching your face and you're touching, you could actually make things worse. I, I'm not entirely convinced by that, but there's, but there's some, some folks mm -hmm. who provide some evidence on that. Um, I, I think, again, I think the, my reading of it is that the literature is uncertain on this point. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to be educated on it. If people will give me good evidence, I'll change my mind. Um, so I think the, 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 the so I, I think um, we have to reflect what the evidence says. We shouldn't create stigma against uh, and, and disunion with our public health messaging. But those are the two points I want to make. I, I don't. I, you can hear my residents talk about this. I don't. I have not formed a, a strong opinion about this. About this, probably because from, from what I've read in the public, from the from in the literature about this. So it's just, I, I don't understand why we should we should we should work very hard against things we know for certain are bad, creating stigma around disease, uh, creating disunion in the in in, uh, in the public. Um, we, public health should never do that, right? Um, Let's reflect the, 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 what, the, what the literature says about masks as, as truthfully as we can, provide it good guidance to public health without doing those other things. I think we've failed on masks. So if I take a small risk, or you're younger than I am, so if you take an even smaller risk, and let's say you or I get COVID-19, we're not harming other people, on the contrary. By having COVID-19, we're actually helping building the herd immunity that then will protect others. So to shame people for becoming infected, I think is very, very damaging, both uh, in terms of, uh, uh, as a society, sociologically and psychologically, is, is very you know, uh, inappropriate. Uh, but also, it doesn't make any sense from public health, because if somebody, I don't think anybody should deliberately go out and get sick, but if somebody gets sick, uh, they're actually helping with building the herd immunity that eventually will uh, protect those who are truly high at risk. So if I don't wear a mask, I don't think you should shame me. You should say, well, thank me for taking a s small risk, uh, which eventually will build the herd immunity that will protect uh, those that are vulnerable uh, in society, the elderly and high risk people. But they're saying not wearing a mask not only is not about your own, it's not, an analogy is not wearing a motorcycle helmet and you're choosing, it's, it's that you're also protecting others and that it's, a, I, I mean, I believe this is the specific messaging, at least from Governor Cuomo, is that you are being disrespectful to your fellow citizens because you could be asymptomatic or whatever and that you're not protecting them. Even if the evidence is inconclusive, wear it anyway, just in case to protect so, so other I, I people. So, but just to build on what Mark was saying, when I am with my eight-year-old mom, I will wear a mask because she's vulnerable. I want, I want to, I mean, this is what the data says. Uh, I, I don't know that it will actually protect her a whole lot, but it, it provides some partial protection to her. Absolutely. When I'm with my uh, 13, 15-year-old, 19-year-old kids, I'm not going to wear a mask. Right? That, that they're not at risk. At, they're, not, they're not at very high risk should they get infected. 
right? And I, I don't want them to wear a mask. Even if I am at high risk, I want to see, I, I, I want to see their face, um, right? So I think uh, it's, it's a balance always uh, of what the evidence is saying and then what we value. It's never just the science says do this. Well, I think that you're talking about in your family. I think people are talking about in public where, of yeah. course, no one's going to wear it with their children. But when you go into a store or you're in an environment like this, or even though this is a private event or somewhere else, again, this messaging around morality and also around the science of even if it's inconclusive, why not take this extra step to protect others? I mean, the, even what Martin's saying is that uh, you're actually helping people by not wearing masks in mm -hmm. some contexts. Right. Right, so it, it sort of flips the, the externality around. You're not helping them if they're vulnerable. Yeah. If you're in a store and there's a vulnerable person and you're not wearing a mask, and if you're asymptomatic, you're... Yeah, so when, when I'm in a store, risk. when I go to the supermarket, I wear a mask. You do? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Dr. yeah I do wear a mask in, in the supermarket, it's true. Mm -hmm. But, you know, all of these things can be reconciled. That's what we're saying, I think, you know. On the one hand, I mean, I agree, I just don't know. I haven't had any insight from doing the limited amount of exploration of the literature on mask wearing to come to a firm conclusion. Um, my colleague Carl Hennigan tells me they really don't work except in very, very specific settings and I trust him. But, you know, I think there is a point there certainly to mask wearing not being that harmful that we need to jump up and down about people not wearing masks. and. So, you know, that we're not doing that. We're saying don't lock down. We're not saying don't wear masks. So there is, yeah. and then masks could, could be used judiciously, even if there's not enough evidence. Certainly, unfortunately, my 80 year old mother is stuck in Calcutta and I haven't seen her in a long time as a result. But, you know, if I could see her, I'd certainly wear a mask or whatever. Um, so we could use these things judiciously to add whatever extra protection they might add to an interaction with a vulnerable person specifically. Um, in the UK, we were doing this thing of opening up the stores, speaking of shops, the supermarkets for an hour every morning, only to vulnerable shielding people. And we got rid of that because we said, no, 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 everyone can mingle and wear masks. And I suspect that might have done more harm in terms of mm. any protection offered to vulnerable people. But then the bigger question that you said, this sort of virtue signaling and um, sense of that, that this is not an individualist, you know, that the, well, the not wearing masks is individualism or libertarianism, that really needs to be knocked on the head. Because that is simply not the case. The reason to, um, to, to, put, to want to build up herd immunity or to, to suggest strategies that don't require the wearing of masks or whatever it is, is a, a baseline, a very communitarian approach to the problem. And that needs to come through. And so to, to, to be, um, you know, to, to, to affect this kind of indignation, I think, against people who are not adhering to practices which are, you know, don't have an obvious benefit. It's very damaging. One thing we haven't really talked about so much is the fact that the lockdown, with the lockdown, we are protecting uh, low-risk uh, college students, and we're protecting low-risk professionals who can work from home at the expense of uh, high-risk uh, older working-class people uh, who is driving the bus or uh, uh, working in the supermarket. Uh, driving a cab or uh, 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 working as a janitor, etc., who don't have the option to work from home and who don't have the option to take time off from work. So in a sense, with the lockdown, we are shifting the burden from the uh, more privileged members of society, which includes you and me, and onto the working class who are required now or are been forced to bear the burden of uh, COVID-19 or the pandemic. And it's the double whammy for the working class um, because it's both with respect to the pandemic, COVID-19, but they also bear the brunt of the burden for uh, uh, other aspects of public health, uh, public schools, for example. Um, 
the rich kids, they can have a pot school or they can go move to a private school or they can get a tutor or their, their uh, uh, parents can. I was teaching my son trigonometry, but I don't think every parent is capable of doing that. Uh, so, but the working class children, they are really dependent on the school, the public schools in a much greater uh, 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 amount. So we are really, with the lockdown, we're really protecting very low risk, privileged people in the middle and upper class while we're throwing the lower working class under the bus. And especially the urban working class, because by nature, this type of infectious disease always can hit cities more than the countryside because there's more contacts in the city. So the, the, the threshold for herd immunity is, is, is higher in a city than in the countryside. So it's especially the urban working class that's being uh, disproportionately hit and uh, carrying the burden of this pandemic, both the disease and the collateral damage. Also, if you widen your view from just your own community to the outside your community to the country, to I mean to the world globally, then uh, you know you have you have to really think about what these practices are actually achieving, and the level of nationalism that has been sort of unashamedly kind of wheeled out as a strategy to protect oneself or, or members of the community. Um, from the incursion of COVID it is, is really quite alarming. You know, the, the idea of the two academics who wrote in a national newspaper in um, the UK recently saying, look, we're an island, we can close the borders. And you're thinking, I bet you guys also voted against Brexit. I mean, you know, where, where is the... What has this done to our general, uh, you know, sense of where our responsibilities as citizens of, of the world. It seems to have completely destroyed some very basic propositions and precepts that we'd agreed upon, I thought, mm. until this point. Did I want to put up the floor? John, why don't you go ahead? Um, I want to start with Sumatra on the question from earlier. Uh, the New, York, New York Times has noted that the first COVID case outside of China came out in Thailand. Um, but interesting about Thailand is in most of the crowded cities, they have very few uh, COVID cases, uh, very few deaths. Uh, Burma, extraordinarily, extraordinarily low deaths. As of July, Vietnam, they hadn't reported any COVID deaths. And so I'm wondering. It's all speculation. Do you think that's part of it spread to those countries so quickly that the immunity already happened? Or do you think that ultimately they're going to say there's a genetic factor with this that hasn't even been discussed? Why is the Orient so unaffected by this? Well, that, there is a huge difference in um, the, the death rates um, across various countries. And, one of the obvious answers to that is the age structure. So we've just been talking about how age um, stratified the risk is. So obviously countries with, um, where the age structure is different, where there isn't a huge elderly population, are going to be, overall, the death rates are going to be lower, just, just by that fact alone. Um, so yes, it is entirely possible that in many of these countries it's spread through, including China itself, largely asymptomatically, that some of the, the cases, the deaths that occurred were indistinguishable that, uh, from flu or something, maybe with all pneumonia, I don't know, I mean, that, that's one scenario that's possible, that it's already disseminated um, widely in these places. So I'd rather hope that that was the case for India, actually, that I come from. Um, that it had already gone through and no one had noticed because there were so few deaths and many of them were just written off as pneumonia. So that's one possibility. Um, but certainly that is not, has not proved to be the case for India anyway. Uh, then the other possibility is that one of the things we haven't talked about here is resistance that occurs in the population as a result of previous exposure to other circulating coronaviruses. 
you know, four of these. And actually, one of the things we're working on in my research group is to try and understand that relationship. And there are many other uh, research groups around the world working on that, and we're to try beginning to understand that previous exposure to other coronaviruses, whether through antibody responses or other arms of the immune response, such as T cells, do are there. There's a study published yesterday showing that 80% of people in the UK have antibodies that cross-react with the novel coronavirus from previous exposure to other coronaviruses. Now, this might may be more prevalent in certain settings. It may be more prevalent among older people in settings where older generations mix more with younger generations. So there are a lot of interesting considerations and a lot of hypotheses that we should be testing um, that, that the, these differences throw up. And what we should be doing now is focusing on those questions and trying to answer those questions so as to get better understanding of this process and to come up with strategies, not just for controlling COVID, but also thinking about the future and how maybe we need to encourage intergenerational mixing if that turns out to be protective and avoid you know, other eventualities like this. Um, so, Jay, you're more of a health economist, and so it raises, at least to me, an obvious question, but one that I was on a China show and was just destroyed by three doctors estimate of just the, the insults that you would be free to bring in at markets in this. Um, but the U.S. companies are the most valuable in the world, and, they, and they're the most valuable in the world because they've got enormous exposure to China. Uh, there's 4,200 Starbucks in China on the way to 7,000. There's uh, you know, GM sells more cars in China. Everyone knows the numbers. Nike uh, sells more in China than they do in any other country, say, the United States. And I just think it's interesting that market signals, what, tell me what you think, were indicating in January and December even that this was not a serious thing, at least from a lethality standpoint. And I base this on Starbucks was hitting all-time highs, Nike was hitting all-time highs, U.S. markets were hitting all-time highs, all based on a, a huge China component. If this had been a major killer, we knew back in January, does this factor into anything? Because uh, when I brought some doctors just said, oh my God, you're a heartless loser for even presuming to look at market signals. How do they factor into how you? Uh, so, so I, there's a couple of uh, elements that, and let me just answer them one by one. So, so first, let me just answer the direct question. I think what happened in China uh, led us to have a picture of what the virus was going to do worldwide that was very misleading. Right. So, what happened in China? It, it, it was a small frac, like bit of what happened when when the when the virus in Italy, for instance, or the virus in Europe. The virus in New York, right? That 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 expectation around the deaths that we saw in China, and you can see it in the public health messaging, World Health Organization, and so on. They had formed expectations from what was happening in China. It looked like a, it was it was, was going to be a bad virus, but it wasn't like a world pandemic that was that was going to require shutting the entire world down, right? So I think that the market signals and also the epidemiologic data coming out of China were, in some sense, in that sense, reassuring relative to what actually has ended up happening. In, in January, March, or January, February, right? Uh, I think so. I think there's there's that aspect of it. I think that that, that the market signals, I think, are, are, are I mean, I, I pay attention to them, but they're not they're not definitive. You want to look at with other other evidence associated with that as well. Uh, there's another aspect to your question, which I think is really also very important, um, and that has to do with uh, the trade-offs in being you know, with, 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 uh, 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 just a small thing, like it's, it's not it's not a small thing. Uh, the, you know, we uh, a billion lives have been lifted out of poverty because of the economic growth of the last twenty plus years worldwide. When you have an economic collapse of the, of, the, of the sort we're getting, it's going to harm the well being of billions and billions of people. It just is, and so to just discount that as if it's just money is a is a moral mistake. Uh, so I think I think that uh, I, mean, I as I said I, I I personally have been reluctant to weigh in on this for fear of being accused of being heartless, thinking only about money. I, I don't I, I don't 
I mean, to me, economics is a is a vehicle for well being for people. If that's that's what it's for. If it's just money, then I don't care about it, right? And I, so I think uh, maybe I should be less less reluctant and more brave. But I don't. I don't. I, I think that uh, narrative is has has ha actually caused a lot of harm. Um, this is directed toward Martin, and it's based on something that, that Jay has said. Around your eighty-year-old mother, you don't wear a mask, and no, I do. Oh, you do. You, yeah. you, you, you do wear a mask. Um, Martin, based on what you say, that we should celebrate someone who who gets it because they're enhancing the path toward broader immunity. Uh, my parents live in Southern California too, and they're near eighty. None of that. They and none of their friends wear masks. It's, it's probably political, but it's also just a rejection of the submission and all this. Don't we want to celebrate those people too? Because people who disagree with consensus are information providers. You want people in society who have a devil may care attitude because they produce information as valuable about the virus as crazy people like my wife who are washing their hands six times an hour. And every time she sees me, making sure that I'm doing something with my hands, don't we want to celebrate the people who reject the consensus? Uh, I don't know if I want to say that we should sort of either uh, celebrate or uh, or shame people uh, specifically. Uh, certain things like basic hygiene, like washing hands, uh, I think that's good for everybody to do. That will lower the threshold needed for herd immunity. If somebody is sick, it's good to stay at home. So those basic measures, I think, should be done by everybody. Um, those are not things that cause harms like closing schools. Closing schools cause great harms. Uh, your wife washing the hands, I think, wonderful that uh, does not harm anybody uh, if somebody wants to do it six times a day or six times an hour or one time an hour I, I'm not going to have an opinion on one way or another on that um, in terms of in terms of the the mass for children for example um, the best example we have and when we are, when we are scientists if you want to know what is the risk for some exposure, we have to look at those who were exposed. And the only children who were exposed uh, uh, by having schools open were the Swe children in Sweden, because Sweden was the only major Western country who kept the schools open throughout the height of the pandemic. Uh, so from ages 1 to 15 in daycare and uh, schools, um, it was open. And as I said, there were zero death uh, during this whole time among these uh, children. Uh, they were not ma wearing masks. They were not socially distancing in schools. If they were sick, they were sent home or told to be home. Um, they did some extra cleaning in the schools. That's always a good thing. Uh, I don't think there was any big school gatherings with uh, in the with like hundreds of kids because they kept in their small rooms. So there were sort of precautions taken like that, but there were no masks or social distancing. They were allowed to be children. Uh, so we know that uh, mask, putting masks on children is not going to put... Uh, n to have children not wearing masks in school is not putting them at risk. It's not putting the teachers at risk because the teachers were not at any higher risk than other, the average of other professions in Sweden. Um, so, I think in, in, uh, so I think the evidence is sort of clear there that in terms of public health that we don't need to do that to children. Well, one last question, and I'll so away, but um, you go back to 1983, I, I was in my teens during the AIDS crisis, and, and uh, well, famously An Anthony Fauci wrote a report in 1983 saying it could be passed within a room between people. And we know that's not true now, how, how little we know, and uh, probably only Jay remembers this, but on Dynasty, a popular show in the 1980s, Rock Hudson, uh, Subsequently, it came out that he was gay, but everyone knew it. Uh, kissed Linda Evans. He died of AIDS not long after. Oh gosh, did he give her AIDS? And so we laugh about that now, given how little we know. Um, how do 
how well do you think what we know now is going to age? History says that it doesn't what we presume. And I guess it speaks back to what Jay said. The horrors of what's being done to the world based on this. The, it's 130 but the million, but uh, New York Times, that, that same economist that might be 285 million rushing towards starvation. Doesn't, don't the skeptics owe it to all of us to be much more uh, verbal in their disdain for, <laughs> for people like Anthony Fauci and others. Uh, we don't trust, the Soviet Union had experts and it was a, tra a tragedy. Uh, what they're doing um, in, with very little knowledge is just terrifying. And, uh, I mean, that's haunted me, John. I, I think, um, we may look back on this as one of the biggest public health mistakes of, of, in history. I really believe that. Uh, and I think uh, it's just, it's the, it's, uh, when we look back and count the harms from the lockdowns, we will look back and say, what, what, why did we do this? That's what I believe. Are we able to look at, um, you know, you worked on the Santa Clara study, which had some degree of controversy around it. You know, um, but when we look at different countries, but even within, within the United States, there are some states, such as Florida, for example, you know, where they're more opened up than New York, for example, and in particular in an area that I've been researching and focusing on for quite a while now with schools. Do we, do we have data now that, you know, I don't know if you've been looking at this area in particular, but can we start to say, okay, we actually have a real world experiment underway right now with two different control groups. We have students in New York where the uh, positivity rate has been hovering around 1% for more than two months straight now, maybe even three months, 1% where uh, my kid's school is closed or at most in a hybrid mode, teetering between the two of them where they're home most days of the week. And then you have kids who are in Florida for, it's been a number of weeks now, um, in school every day. Is there enough evidence now where we can at least preliminarily start to say, huh, we actually have a real world experiment underway and it turns out group A is right and group B is wrong, or are we not there yet? On, on kids and schools, I think the, the data are in. It, it is safer for kids to be in school in person than, is, than to close them down. I, I, and there's, I mean, I can be unequivocal on this. Like, there's not, uh, 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 on the one side, there have been vanishingly few deaths and hospitalizations from the open schools in the places that have opened them. Not zero, but very, very few. Uh, and on the other side, the harms from keeping the schools closed are, are, are evident and clear to every single parent, I think, that, that's honest with themselves. Um, so I think I think that that is not a, a place where there's still a, a ton of uncertainty. It's not uncertainty, at least not in my mind. Uh, we, we we should be using resources to protect the teachers, absolutely. But it is it, it is absolutely it, 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 you can't look at the scientific evidence. They it, it, it points in the direction of let's keep schools closed. It points in the direction of keeping them open. And from a public policy point of view, we should figure out how to use that fact and, 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 and to to make that happen. The CDC has said this. Why do you think there's such recalcitrance, you know, against this? Again, I, you know, just as someone who's in New York and has been covering that area closely, it is. I mean, this is it is on you know Sisyphean um, to to try to uh, move the needle on this to mix my metaphors, but um, um, it, it's it's an incredible challenge, um, and I don't understand and. I understand that, you know, and I'm just using New York because it's such a, I live there, but also it's such a you know, prominent state in, in the country, but surely the governor has access to the data and information that you three have access to. I think what, it's what, what Jay, is the disconnect? I, I think it's what Jay said before, that the people among us who are at high risk, the older, they're underestimating what the risk is for them. But the people uh, younger, uh, both children, both with regard to children and uh, adults who are in the 20s, 30s, and 40s and 50s, they tend to overestimate, thinking that the risk is much, much higher than it actually is. But he has, he has a team of, of health experts who surely know the information that you're talking about here 
what I'm trying to understand is that, and again, this may be outside your purview, <laughs> your head, but um, I can't. I don't have access to them. They won't answer my, you know, my questions. But is, but since the data is so clear on this, and since we even have a real world experiment underway with other states that are open, how can it be that a governor, you know, and oh, yeah. I'm just picking on him. Part, but part of it is also, I mean, I, this, I can pick up from your own work, David. I mean, like I think for some part of the population. The, the richer, the what more well to do, they can they can substitute for the harm from not being in person schooling by hiring private tut tutors, doing these pods, uh, and so the harms aren't as salient. And of course, the, the, the te they tend to be more politically more powerful. I mean, that's one amateur public guy attempt at this. Um, uh, I, I I mean, I, I think there's something to that. Um, but but uh, like I think the really it's, 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 it's if, if people really understood what the risk the age stratified risks actually are they would make different decisions and the public health messaging needs to change to reflect what the data are saying so that we correct this misperception or else we're going to keep making mistakes and again I don't blame the people that have this misperception it's incumbent on us mm -hmm. in public health to make the messaging clear so that it's consistent with the data and we haven't done that. I wonder if I can ask a question of Sinatra, if I may. In, in several interviews, you've spoken in a very uh, surprising and, and compelling way about what I think you call the social contract as it relates to infectious diseases, even a global social mm -hmm. contract as it relates to infectious diseases. And when you first said that, I'd never heard that before. I can't stop thinking about it. I think it's so interesting. I, and I just wondered if you'd be willing to talk about that. Certainly, although I'm sure, <laughs> um, you know, I, I hope I'm using the word correctly. Um, as I understand it, the social contract is something that sort of is endogenously generated uh, within a community, which essentially, again, leads to this kind of optimized state whereby the well-being of everyone is considered and we arrive at an optimum solution for how to deliver that. So with regard, by also accepting, uh, being realistic, having a realistic appreciation of what those risks are. So if we, with many infectious diseases, we know that in order to eradicate them, eliminate them, or even to keep them, suppress them, so we could, you know, for example, with flu, we could say, well, flu kills, you know, 650,000 people a year uh, globally, um, I mean, around the planet. So um, maybe we should do the same for flu, but we don't. So, I mean, I think it's often it's important to try and understand these things in the context of a, a similar situation. So we say, well, what, why don't we? What, what are we thinking? What is a society? What's the contract here? And the contract here is sort of a, a combination of everything that we've been discussing. We want schools to remain open. We want people to flourish in their lives. We want uh, inequality not to get any worse. Um, we want, and something we haven't talked about, the arts. We need the arts to be there and to flourish. You know, w what are we alive for? I'm not saying it's just the arts, but, you know, culture needs to be uh, nourished. And so we put all of these things on a plane and arrive at a transaction, really, whereby we say, OK, we're going to tolerate this level of disease in the population. It will kill some people. Uh, we will try and protect them. We, you know, we, we just do our best within that context, within those um, boundaries, to try and make it all work. And I think that's the social contract. And that's what's being ignored within, and, and, and when someone says, well, I'm 45 years old and I don't want to go and teach in a class, I think that's extremely individualistic. And yet they're able to, or they're not aware, I think, to be fair to them. They're not, they're being allowed to ignore how individualistic that is by being given, um, I mean, a bit, by being not made fully aware of what those risks actually are, not placing it in the context of the harm that it actually does to say, oh, actually, the schools should be closed. Um, 
and are not being being encouraged to think nationalistically, and and all this sort of virtue signalling around. Oh, if you're not, you, you are actually protecting others by performing certain activities. So they're you know buying indulgences in some ways for what is actually a very individualistic approach. I have a question. Um, I'm interested in something that you had said earlier and that you think this might have been one of the greatest mistakes that's ever been made in the public health context. And I think if we look at Sweden, they didn't do a lockdown, they have average mortality for the year. We look at Peru, they did a really tight lockdown, they have very high mortality. Let's just premise the question on the fact that this lockdown just didn't work for its purposes, which is minimizing mortality. And I'm wondering if you're aware of the origination of this concept of lockdown, where you asked to engage in a scientific debate within your expertise about this idea. Was, was there any engagement in the scientific community? And then if there wasn't, where do you think this idea came from? And how you know, do you think it was realistic conceptually? So, so the initial, I think, uh, the first I heard about this lockdown idea, uh, I, I confess, I mean, I, I've now looked back and seen some discussion of it in, in the earlier uh, aftermath of H1N1, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. Um, H1N1 flew to 2009. But at, at, uh, the first I heard, I heard about the lockdown idea was this idea of, of, uh, of containing, uh, containing the spread so the hospitals didn't get overwhelmed, flattening the curve. Right? That, was the, that was the original first, first uh, and so I think that, ideas uh, seemed right, and actually it was right in some places. There was some threat of overrunning the hospitals. It made some sense that we, because a lockdown, what it does is it, it delays the, the onset. It, it does anything, it delays the onset of this. It doesn't eliminate it, it doesn't get rid of the, 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 the cases. It just puts it off into the future. And so it made some sense in that, in that setting. What stunned me was that in places where there was very little risk, the lockdowns were imposed one after the other. A, a very little risk of run, overrunning the hospitals. It was imposed one after the other. And then what stunned me even more is that we've had almost, it's been very difficult to generate a discussion and a debate about those, those lockdowns as they continued into in the March, April. Uh, that, that, that debate didn't happen. It sort of, by assumption, it, it sort of stayed in place. Even the flattening the curve concept was there a debate prior to this? I mean, there was there was some some discussion. Um, I mean, again, I think these were based on these models. So uh, the, uh, the, these, these these like the the, the, the the Imperial College model, the IHE model, and others had some projections that looked very scary for overrunning hospital capacity. That informed the debate about the, the initial lockdowns in March. And I'm just talking the United States and the rest of the world. That there's a, there's, I mean, there may be a different dynamic. Um, but there was very little discussion after that about what they're for. And, it, um, and the, the, the end point, um, I think, look, we're trying to be clear about what we think the end point is. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see some discussion about, I mean, and I think the other, other, uh, other point of view is the end point is, is the vaccine. But there's risk around that. Like we don't know what the vaccine trials are going to show. And in fact, as the the number of cases in the in, uh, starts to decline, it actually makes it more and more difficult to run a vaccine trial, mm -hmm. right? Because you need more larger sample sizes when you have a lower risk in the population for the thing that you're trying to prevent. Um, so I think I think this is one of these things where like I, I, I there really hasn't been a full debate. We sort of have landed in those policy by default from this sort of this hysteresis of. Let's flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm very encouraged by this event. Let's start this debate. Did you encounter any debate over lockdown prior to this disease appearing in the world? Have you ever heard of it? Been Lock, asked locked, no, I mean, yes, I, I remember talking to my elder daughter, said, I think we're going to go into lockdown. I said, never, never in this country <laughs> do that. And then I realized what's going on, which is what prompted us to publish. Or, uh, our, our exercise saying that look, we need to be very clear that there are several scenarios that match the current data. Mm -hmm. And the scenario where the virus has already been circulating is completely plausible and mm -hmm. possible. So, but my personal motivation at that point um, was, was this that, that, you know, as you say, lockdown for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. Is something perhaps some of these nations, the UK, the US, could afford. But what really bothered me was the idea of locking down 
in the slums in, in India, in the townships of South Africa, I mean, in Brazil. I mean, that was terrifying. And you knew that that was what, what was going to happen. If this, and, and that was the reason why we didn't rush to get that big round. Was there a debate after that? No. <laughs> And it's interesting that, that there wasn't one before. <laughs> I, I thought I read your paper, <laughs> and I thought that it would move the move the needle. I thought that the the Santa Clara study and the LA County study would, would move the needle. I, I mean, I, I have been stunned at that. that, that, that uh, and, and you know, I don't mean to be, you know, uh, I, I, I I I guess I'm, I was naive. I'll just say that um, about how important data is in this discussion. At least it was then. But I don't know. It has to be permanent. I think we, we are we are reasonable people. Um, you know, we will. We, I think data eventually wins. Um, yeah. Well, the problem, the other problem I have is, so then what we did is we rushed to get an antibody test out there and tried to get samples mm -hmm. to test, and we were stymied by the yeah. whole politics of science and getting samples. We got some from Scotland, which we then mm -hmm. assayed, and, and seroprevalence levels weren't terribly high. Mm -hmm. And there again, I was naive because I mainly worked on flu, mm -hmm. and this methodology we were using was something we were applying to flu. And in flu, you do see that antibody levels are a good marker of at least recent exposure. That is unfortunately not true for coronaviruses. The antibody, lots of people don't make antibodies, antibodies decay quickly, um, and then you have these pre existing responses, T cell responses, all sorts of other responses that we weren't measuring through our particularly neutralizing antibody response. So um, so there again, you know, that it's true, you, you learn that thing. So unfortunately, I was hoping we'd do these antibody surveys and we'd all find that everyone had six percent antibodies and whatnot. Um, but you know, in these six months we've learned that that's not the case. It's much more complicated. A lot of people are already resistant and um, so we need to keep learning on that score. So I guess I pose this to all of you. Uh, I'm a social scientist, I work with data, but I also know credibility matters a great deal in social sciences. And we have for decades had things like uh, replication issues that have played out in the journals. One of the things that's really concerned me about the, the whole COVID pandemic and the aftermath to it is that credibility issues have started to appear also in the, the physical sciences, the medical sciences. And I wanted to ask you uh, about what, what do you think the risks are there for public perception of scientific expertise, which I do think has taken a hit, it's been damaged in, in many respects, and then uh, I guess to follow up on that, what can be done to repair it? I think uh, my major concern currently is, of course, uh, the pandemic and all the collateral damage uh, that's occurring, but there's no doubt in my mind that this whole thing is uh, creating a huge hit on the public trust in science and scientists uh, for two reasons. One is the, the disregard for basic public health principles that our response to the pandemic uh, has done. That's one reason. The other reason is the lack of uh, uh, an open scientific discussion. And I want people who disagree with me, I want to hear what they have to say. And to shut that down uh, is damaging to the trust in science. If only one sort of side is, uh, is quoted in the news media, for example. That really damaging, the, because then people will eventually find it, but they will find it through some other uh, roundabout ways. And then I say, well, why wasn't that part of the scientific discussion? So it will be obvious to people, uh, to regular folks, that we didn't have an open discussion, and then they're going to have uh, 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 concerns about other things. And one thing is, for example, the trust in vaccines. Vaccines is, in my view, very important. But when you damage the scientific discussions about the pandemic, that's going to have a, a, a flow over into uh, the trust on other aspects of science, including, for example, vaccines. There are many other uh, aspects of it. So it's, it's, uh, for the long term, I think that's a big concern. For the short term, my major concern is the pandemic and all the collateral damage. 
I would have to agree that, I mean, again, the, the, the public learns from this that science does not move forward through consensus. That will be a very good lesson for the public.